Have you ever been in a space where you just started tuning out the conversation? Where you're just like, this does not apply to me and I don't care anymore. You ever been there? A couple of you, the rest of you listen intently every Sunday morning, <laughs> you do. You know, one of my favorite uh, illustrations of this is uh, the Charlie Brown comics where the gr grown-ups always talk but you never can understand what they're saying. You resonate with Peppermint Patty and Charlie as they're just like, I don't care. So check this out. This is what it sounds like. Yeah. Churches, churches like this sometimes. You're like, man, that sermon's great for my friend. I hope they're listening because I'm good. Like I... I, I, I don't struggle with that at all. I'm fine. And today we're talking about one of those topics. But I want to just encourage you as we talk about the sixth commandment. That this commandment isn't just for people out there. It's for people in here. It's for you and me. Because we all find ourselves in jeopardy of breaking this commandment. Now the commandment is the commandment not to murder. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. We're going to read it together. It's the shortest commandment of all the 10. It simply says this, do not murder. Now, a lot of us are like, okay, cool. I'm good. I <laughs> don't murder. I've never murdered, never felt like I was going to murder. I mean, maybe my kids a couple of times, but like never, never, <laughs> never going to murder anybody. So why do I have to listen to the rest of the message? And this is a short commandment. In fact, the commandment is just tied into two words in Hebrew, three in English. The word is lo rasa, which simply means don't kill anybody. That's it. Now, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments in this series, and we've been talking about how they're not simply a list of rules that you're supposed to do so that God will like you, so that God will love you, so that you can go to heaven. Instead, they're an invitation to a relationship with God. And the first four are tied with our vertical relationship with God, how to love him and how to know him. So we've been looking at those. But the next six are about loving others. And the way that we love others shows us how God loves us and reflects our affection for God. And this particular commandment, the commandment not to murder, is an important one. It's important because God has created men and women in his image. And this commandment is tied directly on how to honor God's image in somebody else. That every single person has intrinsic value because they're created in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 6, God had destroyed the earth and was rebuilding it with Noah. And God says this, he gives him one of these commands right here to Noah. He says, whoever sheds human blood by humans, his blood will be shed for God made humans in his image. And so this idea of murder and how destructive it is, is in both the horizontal axis that we cannot damage or destroy another human being and take their life because that's wrong, but also we're destroying the image of God, an image bearer, and that's also an affront to God. Now, the Israelites, when they understood this, it wasn't simply a commandment not to kill, because the commandment is tied to destroying a person or killing somebody for your own interest, an unauthorized taking of life. And the Old Testament allowed the taking of life through war and through capital punishment. So there are over six different capital punishments that the Old Testament says these are things that are a crime against the government or against society, and there is a capital offense too. And there's also a provision of war, which is an important one because I know there are many veterans in this room where you're wondering, like, is it okay to take life in war? The Bible does not really understand or know the idea of a pacifist. But in the Old Testament, in particular, there is war and conflict throughout the entire thing. And even in the New Testament, you see it. So this is not saying, hey, listen, you cannot take a life during war. 
or through the government or even through self-defense. What this is saying is that you cannot take a life directly or indirectly uh, uh, because of self-interest, because you want to, because life is sacred. God has created life and it is not up to us to be able to take it. Now, a lot of us are like, great, I understand that. Again, not really having any problems with murdering anybody. But I want to put before you three aspects where we do break this commandment. And they all start with an A because I'm a good Baptist today. And they are these. Appetite, anger, and apathy. Because see, what we find ourselves here is not simply just in the uh, explanation of what this commandment is, but actually applying it to our regular life that we find ourselves in trouble. So appetite. Let's talk about appetite today. When it comes to murder, we have become consumers. We consume it. We have an appetite for it as content or as entertainment. As a nation, murder is part of our national discourse. We we watch shows about it. We listen to podcasts about it. We we consume it. We're intrigued by it. 24% of all Uh, podcasts are true crime podcasts, and we watch them and listen to them regularly. When if you watch Dateline, every single one of them is about a murder, right? It's always the husband or the wife did it. Murder is part of the national discourse. We see it on television in the news. We watch Netflix shows like the Murdoch murders here, here in South Carolina. Why? Because we're fascinated by it, and it's become all-consuming in our culture. And I'm, I'm convinced that I watch too many murders on television. I'm right there with you. There's this glorification of murder in our culture. Statistics tell us that by the time a child turns 18, they've witnessed 16,000 simulated murders and seen 200,000 acts of violence on television and on screens. It is pervasive in our culture. And there should be something within us that says that's not right. If murder is something God says grieves him, it's the destruction of the the human uh, uh, life, if it's the destruction of God's image, why are we using this as the way we pass our time? So, when you're watching television, watching movies, it's worth considering what you're putting in your mind. Why are we obsessed with murder as a culture? Now, the second thing we see when it comes to murder is the idea of anger. You know, Jesus talks about this commandment, the commandment to not murder in the New Testament. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to take the commandments and then recast them. He teaches them and upholds them, but then also gives us an understanding on how to actually live them out. And in Matthew 5, he takes up the topic of murder and he says this, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to to judgment. So Jesus says, hey, you've heard this. You've seen this in your, your lessons. You've studied this in the Torah that God says you should not murder. Verse 22, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. And whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. What is Jesus doing here? Well, Jesus is saying, you all know it's wrong to murder somebody, but I'm telling you that many of you have anger in your heart. Now, I've, I've read this command, and I've actually read it wrong my whole life until I started preparing this week to study it, because I always read this, and I believed that Jesus was equating anger with killing somebody. He was saying it's the same thing. But that's not exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's saying murder is wrong. We all agree that that's bad. But I want to talk to you about the root motivation, which is anger. And if you're angry at somebody and you call them a fool, the word in Hebrew is raka, which we don't really even know what kind of insult that is. We just know that it's wrong and you shouldn't say it. But Jesus says if you 
insult your brother by saying that word, you can be brought to the courts for it. And not only are you to be brought to the courts, but you are in danger of hell itself. So Jesus is raising the bar on anger. He's saying, just like murder, anger is also deeply destructive and destroys the image of God in somebody else. So watch your anger. Now the scriptures tell us that you can be angry and not sin because Jesus was angry, right? He was angry when he saw the hard-heartedness of the religious leaders. He was angry when he saw the temple filled with, with people selling things and not allowing Gentiles to come in and worship and pray. Jesus was able to be angry and not sin. And you too can become angry and not sin. But often we don't do that, do we? Man, we get angry so quickly. There's a 500% increase in road rage incidents over the last 10 years. You've seen it. You've probably done it. Like, person cuts you off. You're like, oh, I'll show them. Like, like, what are you going to do? Run them off the road? Like, how's that help anything, right? But we've all been there. We're like, man, I hope my pastor's not watching because I'm about to do something I will regret. And maybe you don't do anything. You just envision that car just like blowing up somehow. You're just like, fireball, please, right now, God. Why? Because our anger creates something ugly within us. We do things we never thought we'd ever do. We, we act in ways we never thought we would ever act. But what I find about anger is that anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is not usually the primary thing that's driving our heart to do something we never thought we'd ever want to do. Behind our angry posture, there's something deeper that's happening. You know, sometimes it's helpful for us to understand that when people seem like they're mad, they're really sad. There's something underneath, some disappointment, some hurt, some brokenness that is fueling that moment. And unless we get to the root cause of it, we'll constantly act in ways that we wish that we didn't. And Jesus here is calling us to live a life where we are not fueled by anger, but instead fueled by love. And then he goes on to say this in verse 23. He says, So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Now, this is another part of this passage that I think I always read wrong because I used to think that when Jesus says this, he means that if you're worshiping, and you're coming to the altar with a gift, which a good Jewish person would do. They'd bring a, an offering to replace their sin, and then they would sacrifice it, and their guilt would be transferred onto that animal, and that animal would die in their place. So Jesus said, when you come to come worship, I would always think that it was the, the anger that was in the person coming to worship that needed to be dealt with. And that's true. It should. But that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, when you come to the altar and you remember that somebody else is mad at you, that's when you're supposed to leave that gift and then go make things right. So it's not that I'm mad, but somebody is mad at me. Why? Because Jesus is calling us to pursue peace. He desires reconciliation. He desires wholeness. And it's very difficult to worship when you have a rift, a broken relationship between you and your brother and your sister. So I don't know where you are today, but one of the most holy things you can do is to deal with your anger and to reconcile with people that are angry with you. And I know, listen, there are sometimes like you can try to reconcile and the person doesn't want to return your phone call <laughs> or they don't want to talk to you. But as much as it is possible with you, you should be the kind of person that says, I want to make things right with all people so that, so that I can be free. Because anger breaks something within us. It is deeply corrosive. And when we're angry with people, the only one who truly suffers is us. God has given us so much more than that. He's given us freedom and joy. And I believe that many of us in this room 
are struggling with anger today. We have anger towards a family member or th towards the past or we're harboring bitterness in our heart towards somebody. And Jesus says that is not for you to carry any longer. You need to release it to the Lord. So we see appetite, we see anger, and finally we see apathy. You know, our culture has become desensitized to death. And today I want to talk about apathy, in particular about the apathy towards the plight of the unborn. You know, many of us ignore the murder of the unborn. And I say the word murder on purpose because I believe that the Bible tells us and science backs this up that life begins at conception. It, but I want, I want to get real here with you today. You know, abortion is a, is a great crime. I think our children will someday ask us, how in the world did this happen? But I also know that it is a it is a devastating reality for many people. And what we know about abortion is that since Roe versus Wade was passed, over 55 million children have been aborted. Statistics tell us that 22% of all pregnancies have ended in abortion, which sounds bad, but it's even worse when you realize that it's one out of every five pregnancies. And even in this room or even online, I know this is something that is, that is not just a story that we hear about other people. It's a story that we know has happened to us or to a family member where people have considered abortion or have had an abortion. One fourth of women, uh, so 25%, one fourth of women have had an abortion. And in the church, this is not something that's simply out there. It's actually something that's here in this room and other places that abortion is a, a, a true reality and a tragedy because over one six, so one over six abortions is by an evangelical Christian. Now, I'm not saying this to like make anyone feel terrible today or to drag up a painful past. But I do think that we have to have an understanding of what God says about this because what God says is he says every person has dignity and worth because they're created in the image of God. And that happens not simply after birth, but happens before it. But I do believe that the people, many people who have an abortion, are not doing it because they are angry at the child, they're simply afraid. They're afraid that their life won't look like they wanted it to, or they're afraid that they can't take care of the baby, or they're afraid of judgment, or they're afraid of the fact that everybody's going to know. And I believe that many of of those who are outside of the church think that the church really only cares about babies after before they're born, but don't really care about them afterwards. We're, we're pro-life only before that child comes into the world. But what if it was different? Now, I'm not trying to be political here today. I'm simply advocating for children and for mothers. You know, I wonder if we could change the way that people view unplanned pregnancy and and children. You know, what if, what if instead of being a place where we say, yes, you need to choose life, and instead we said, we choose life with you. Our entire church, our community of faith says we not only ask people to choose life, but we're choosing it too. That we care about children. We care about mothers trying to figure out what life looks like. And what if we created the kind of community that here in Spartanburg County, we made 
abortion seem like it's not even something that's desirable at all because of the way that we love people who say, I'm pregnant, I don't know what to do. And instead of making them feel like they're outsiders, we said, no, you are loved. We'll do anything for you. Whether you want to keep the baby and parent it or place it for adoption, we are in your corner. What would it look like if we were the kind of church that said, any child in this county will have a home, no matter what it takes, because we are for children. We aren't apathetic. We don't put it to the margins. We don't dismiss it. We lean in with all of our heart. See, here's the thing. I know there's some of us who are listening to this right now, or you're hearing it right now, and you're thinking about an abortion right now that you've had in your past, and you feel the weight of it. You regret it every day. You may be thinking about having an abortion right now. You're pregnant, and nobody knows. I want you to hear that if abortion is part of your story, that God is in the business of redeeming stories and lives. That's what God's about. You may be thinking, I've gone too far. I can't be forgiven. If people knew, they would run. Do you think that you're the only one that Jesus couldn't save? Like he could offer grace to every single other person except for you. That you're the exception. Friends, this is why Jesus came. So that people who did not deserve mercy and grace, like all of us, could experience the words that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. If we don't believe it here, we don't believe it anywhere. So what does that mean? Like, what does it mean for us? Well, it means that if you have an abortion in your story, we love you anyway. If you thought about it, but you didn't go through with it, we love you anyway. If you're pregnant, we love you just as you are. Why? Because Jesus has loved us the same way. And there is something beautiful that can happen when you say, I want to choose life. I want God to restore my story. I want him to bring beauty out of ashes. You know, 10 years ago, I, I no, it's more than that. It's about 15 years ago. I remember thinking really strongly about adoption. And I remember having my heart broken for children. We didn't have children of our own at that point, but I remember going on a walk. Tabitha and I had been talking about it a lot, and I just remember telling the Lord, and so I was walking around the block near where we were living in Franklin, Tennessee. I said, Lord, if there's a child that needs a home whose mother is considering aborting that child, we would like to bring that child into our family. Fifteen years passed. And we felt the call to adopt again. And we were able to bring Josiah into our family. Josiah is the textbook definition of the kind of story that would normally have ended in a, 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 an abortion. His mom had no resources. She was an addict. She just got her feet underneath her again. And then she got pregnant. But she chose life. And I got a chance to play with them yesterday. And I was so thankful that she said, this child deserves a future. And the story doesn't end there because her story is still tied to his. We still have a relationship with her. And God has taken something that could have been deeply broken and made something beautiful out of it. And God can do the same thing in your story. You know, I think one of the fascinating subplots of the, the crucifixion is the story of a man named Barabbas. Barabbas was considered probably the worst person 
in Jesus' day. He had killed many people. He was a murderer. He was imprisoned, waiting death. He's on death row. And he's in a cell somewhere underneath the fortress Antonia, right near where Jesus ends up coming to meet Pilate. And Pilate is struggling because Jesus is an innocent man. He knows that Jesus does not deserve death. And so he comes up with this idea of how do we get Jesus off the hook? I know I'm going to offer Barabbas instead. And they're going to choose to kill Barabbas instead of Jesus. And Jesus can be free. But the crowd was against Jesus. And instead of saying they wanted Jesus released, they said, we want Barabbas a murderer to go free. Imagine being Barabbas, no light, terrible food, imprisoned, waiting for death for a crime that he did commit. All he hears is, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And he thinks that he's going to his death until they open the door and they say, you're free to go because a man named Jesus took your place. If Jesus can do that for him, he can do that for you. With your anger, with your appetites and your apathy, God can do that for you. Because God is calling you to freedom. And it starts by saying, my heart is yours. I want something new. So, that's our time of reflection today. God changed my heart. I don't know what God has pricked on your heart today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But it starts by saying, God changed my heart. It may be, you know what? I want to, I want to no longer just glory in murder anymore. I, I, I'm cutting that part out of my life. It may be anger. You're going to say, I, I need to hand you my anger. It may be that God wants to change your heart, that you can actually forgive yourself because God has forgiven you. It may be that you say, I want to take a step forward. I want to be the kind of person that creates homes for children and, and comes around moms that need help. I, I want to be that person. And if that's you, we actually have a meeting today at four where you can find a practical next step in making that a reality in our county where you can say, I'm for moms and I'm for kids and I will give my life towards that. But it all starts with the heart. So, I want to pray, and I'm going to let you just sit in this moment as Steve and the team comes forward. God, would you change our heart? God, would you break our heart for what breaks yours? God, would you give us not hard hearts, calloused hearts, but instead give us tender hearts? Hearts that, that long for peace and justice and hope and renewal and the restoration of brokenness. God, I know there's somebody listening to me right now, right here, right now, who's saying, yes, but that's not me. I can't get there. Right now, that woman's heart or that young man's heart who pressured his girlfriend to have an abortion or that young woman's heart who had one, God, I pray that you provide healing, that this is not the end. It's simply the beginning. You have great plans for them. For anybody who's contemplating life or death today, you have no idea where your story is going to lead you if you choose life. It's going to be more incredible than you can imagine. So God, within all of us, would you today, right here in this room, change our hearts? Because your name and your renown is the desire of our heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching today. Please hit subscribe to be notified when we share new uplifting content. 
that will encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And click the link on the screen to get connected and support how God is using this ministry to bless people across the United States and help us with our mission to create a community, a light with Jesus.